Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another photo mishmash. This one being broadcast live July 31st, 2019. We're going to be talking about Sony had a baby A9, a gadget from DJI that I just don't like. Hate's too strong a word, but I definitely don't like this little gadget. And uh, of course, critiquing your Lightroom photos and giving you some tips and tricks, as well as all of the week's photo news and uh, as unusual or usual, because it's two weeks in a row, I feel so lucky. I'm um, welcoming back David Carr to help me co-host the show. David, how are you doing? Thank you. Good, man. Good to see you again. Good to see all of you on the little chat here. So thanks for having me back. Uh, you're very welcome. The only thing I just, I feel like I mention this each time is that you sound so wonderful. It makes me sound crappy. So <laughs> we were talking about that a little bit before the show. I got to do more soundproofing in the room. Maybe, maybe pull the mic down and just put it right in front of my face like this. Does that sound better? That sounds really good. It's rich, man. But then you got this big thing blocking your face. That's yeah. the only problem with this thing. And I, I actually bought a lapel mic for, for something recently and I was going to wear it, but then I thought, no, this is like, you know, something's got to make me look good. So mm -hmm. that's, yeah, it's just, it's even worse when it's just kind of like this weird black thing poking in the corner of the frame. So we'll just, we'll put it back up there. I'll work on the audio. I'll get it better. I promise. Um, okay. let's, let's see a couple of things. One right off the bat, I need to tell you that the show is sponsored by Squarespace. Thank you. Squarespace so much for sponsoring the show. You can save 10% off your first domain website, gallery store, whatever you want to build, you can build it on Squarespace and uh, you can save 10%. You just go to squarespace.com slash photo rec TV. I mentioned this last week. I have moved my own photo rec TV site to Squarespace and the combination of using their tools plus their marketing instead of MailChimp, I'm saving hundreds of dollars a month, literally hundreds of dollars a month. So I don't know if you have as, uh, you know, as large a need as I do, but those tools together, they work fantastically and uh, they're affordable. They really are. So you should check that out at squarespace.com slash TV. It's also brought to you by members like you. I feel like I'm Sesame Street ish when I say that. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of PBS ish, isn't it? A little, but that's okay. I mean, PB, you know, Sesame Street was a big show, so. Uh, is still is I still think. is a very big yeah. show yes yeah. um and uh i say that because uh some of you watching are photo enthusiast network members you have gotten to send in your images to get critiqued and uh lightroom tips and tricks and of course you get tons more content stuff that went out in the past week lightroom wise i did a video on kind of highlighting your subject, a very quick and easy way to make your subject stand out. Maybe you wanna make them look a little bit sharper than the background and you couldn't do that with whatever lens you were using or just the way it got shot. It just doesn't quite look as good as you would like. Or maybe you'd like to put a little bit of more light on your subject. Both of those are really easy to do with the radial filter tools. I show you exactly how I do it and how to kind of even take it to the next level using two, one for the inside, one for the outside. And we had a Tuesday tip. That's your weekly email. You get a new one every week if you're a pen member. This one was from uh, David McKay talking about don't overthink it. And uh, I'll be honest, I haven't read it. But I always am watching our inbox and I can judge how these emails resonate with people based on the replies. And he got a lot of replies on that one. A lot of folks say, I really thank you for this. Thank you for this reminder. I needed this reminder. So there is a fantastic amount of information. Penn has been running now for almost two full years. And every week we've sent out a new email with a Tuesday tip, things from technical information to from the heart to business advice. And all of that is archived and available to you. That's uh, what's 52 plus 52, almost 100, 100 articles. We should turn them into a book. It's not like, a bad idea. Yeah. If you want to find out more, you can go to photorec.tv slash pen or even better, just go to photoenthusiastnetwork.com. Okay. Um, and also at the beginning of the show, we kind of tell you other things that you may have missed. I had a Mount Rainier workshop this weekend, which for the most part was fantastic. We had a little bit of weather sun Saturday morning that was challenging. And then Sunday morning, we had another photographer that was a little challenging, not part of my group, <laughs> but in general, um, I had a really good time showing folks, uh, Mount Rainier. It is just a gorgeous beautiful national park um, and gorgeous mountain. And it didn't erupt while we were there. There's always a chance it could just blow. 
So, you know. Yeah, that's a that's a bonus. That was a that's a plus. <laughs> that would be your like first picture would be great if everybody if oh, anybody it, ever finds your camera. Oh, it'd be amazing. I mean, so the mountain, the, the the volcano did not erupt, but the other photographer did. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like yeah. he kind of blew his top. Yep, definitely a little bit. But we'll <laughs> we'll move on. We'll move on. <laughs> And uh, let's see. And also just this morning, uh, I put out my video on the Tamron 17 to 28. I mistakenly in the email, I keep typing 17 to 35. It would be wonderful as a 17 to 35. It's just the 17 to 28, but still is a really, really good lens. I'm quite happy with it. Go watch that short video to learn a little bit more about it. And all of the show notes, everything we're talking about, the Squarespace link, the Tuesday tips, that's all listed in the show notes, which Roy has so nicely put together for us. Thank you, Roy. Um, and that's accessible under this video with a link. So there we go. Nice. Yeah. I don't know what else to say. Uh, it's a new month. If you are a pen member, don't forget to join the August PPA level image competition. That is the monthly competition where you can win fantastic prizes from Bay photo um let's see it's not on the list david but we were talking before the show both of us are headed off on pretty epic trips within the next couple of weeks yes where are you going again uh some little country called tanzania mm. Tan tanzania yeah your tanzania. pronunciation is perfect perfect yeah, yeah. <laughs> no Tanz tanzania i um I'm so excited. I mean, how could you not be? It's, uh, you know, I've done seven trips in a year now with McKay um, Photography Academy. And, um, you know, I just, my first one was almost exactly a year ago to Glacier National Park. And I just had no idea that a year later I would have seen as many amazing places as I've seen. And Tanzania sounds like it's just going to be epic. I can't wait. So excited. Yeah. Got my yeah. shots and everything. I'm good to go. Good, good. I don't want you to come back with malaria or any of those uh, dengue fever, any of that stuff. I just don't want to do that. I just, no. it's given idea. the choice. Good idea. Um, let me ask you a little bit. So this is the McKay uh, uh, Photography Academy trip. I've been lucky enough to do it a couple of times now mm -hmm. and uh, just was awesome. Tell us a little bit about the gear you're taking on this trip. Yeah, that's a great question because I, I, you know, I'm I'm already thinking about that. I leave in less than two weeks, and um, I I own three bodies uh, that are all very capable and and great in their own ways. Um, but I'm imagining being in the back of this uh, Range Rover or whatever it's going to be, some sort of safari type vehicle, and you know, not not on a tripod and and not not necessarily trying to get these massive uh, high resolution landscape shots, although I'm sure there will be some of that kind of stuff, but really trying to capture wildlife. And so I need speed and something that focuses quickly and accurately. And, um, but I also don't want to haul around, um, a, a bazooka of a lens. Um, although that is kind of what you do in a typical safari situation. You know, I just did my first, uh, YouTube review on the, the Nikon 300 millimeter. Um, uh, it's a F4. And it's a small little lens, but it's amazing. And I'm excited to use that, you know, and 300 millimeters is not necessarily, it's much, it, it's not as much reach as I would like to have, but the compromise of, of having a smaller, lighter lens, that's easier to kind of travel with, but still give me great results. Um, I may have to do a little cropping here and there, but I, I'm pretty excited to try that out. And with a 1.7 uh, times teleconverter. I, I think I'm going to be in pretty good shape with that. I'll probably bring, I have a uh, the, the Nikon D5, which is kind of their flagship. Uh, it's a sports and wildlife camera. And I feel like if I don't bring that, I, you know, why, why have it if I'm not going to take it yeah. to one of the experiences that it was made for, which is wildlife <laughs> and safari kind of stuff. So I'll definitely bring that and... I'm not sure, but I'll, you know, I don't, I don't want to pack too much. I don't think I'm going to need 17 lenses and a bunch of extra stuff. So yeah. I need it. Sounds good. It sounds like a good plan. Um, so I did quick math that 300 plus the 1.7 gives you 510. Is that yeah. Well, it's 500. I mean, it oh, may 500. be technically 510, okay. but it's, they, they say it's 500 and the, the lowest aperture at 500 is 6.7 which is not quite as low as i would like but it's that's not bad that's not, not bad, bad at all for i mean for 500 you know yeah. for anybody that doesn't really 
know or hasn't really worked with a, a really long lens, the longer you go in the in the focal length, you can get away with a, a higher number of f stop, like of your f stop. You, you can get a, away with a higher number. It, you're still going to get tons of bokeh. I, I, at f4 with this 300 millimeter, I get an, a tremendous amount of bokeh. I mean, it looks it's amazing. Um, so I'm not like clamoring for 2.8 or anything. Although yeah. you know, it's always nice to have that. But that 2.8 version of the 300 millimeter lens is a tank. I mean, it is huge. It's awesome, but it's super expensive, super heavy, and I just I'm not at the point where I'm ready to, to to carry something like that around or pay for it. Yeah, yeah, totally. I totally hear that. And you know, with the amount of travel, uh, you I think you have at least one in country flight there in a small bush plane. Yeah, um, which has some pretty strict weight, you know, limits as well. So if you want to yeah. be able to bring clean underwear, say, and then I, I think I think you're making the the right choices. Um, yeah. And six seven at five hundred. That's that's really pretty good. Yeah, it really is. I will say, I you know, when I've shot it at five hundred with you know with that teleconverter, um, images don't tend to be quite as sharp as I want them to be. Mm. Um, although I've shot some that were that are that have been fantastic. I just I took it to the beach recently, and I was kind of up on the uh, patio of the of the condo we were staying in, and I was practicing with it, just kind of trying some you know birds in flight and. It, it nailed focus on, on a few of them, but a lot of them, it was, it kind of was a little trickier. It's a little slower to focus is really the problem. But I, I think you just take a few more shots, you know, hope that, hope that out of the myriad that you take a couple of them are going to be sharp, but it's still, it, it, I, I always, I always tell people with this lens and this, this teleconverter combo is the, the thing is like you, uh, I'll shoot with it at 300 most of the time but for that rare occasion where i'm like okay i really want more reach i'll slap the teleconverter on it's a little bit of time a little bit of effort but to me that little time and effort is worth it to me to to, to you know for the rest of the time be able to just carry a small lightweight lens it just really it's i love it i'm amazed that they made something that small that can do what it can do yeah yeah, that's cool. I think um, you you may be planning on making this video. Um, if you do, then maybe we can tease a little bit of it. But I'd love to see some of your favorite images when you get back and have you talk a little bit more about the gear. Yeah. We should have you on or you should do that and then we'll link to it or something like That'd that. Be excellent. Yeah. Um, which just reminds me that uh, David has started a YouTube channel and uh, I will put a link to that right down below this video as well um, so that you can find that and go subscribe and see his update. He, the, the lens he's talking about taking is the lens that you've reviewed already. The one video you got up there. Yeah. So and I actually started to do another video yesterday, but I just wasn't quite ready. I, I want to tell you the right information and I don't want to just, uh, you know, do it all from memory. So gotcha. try to up my game. Yeah. Um, and so you're headed to Tanzania or whatever you said. I don't know. <laughs> Tanzania. Uh, Tanzania. I'm headed to Alaska, which I just kind of wow. teased on Instagram last night. I've actually only ever been to Alaska in the dead of winter. I've been now four times, <laughs> four frigid trips. Actually, one of the times in December, it wasn't that cold. It was like uh, mid 20s. It was, oh, wow. It was bikini weather. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'm really excited because part of it is a boat trip, uh, kind of uh, with the goal of capturing the bears, catching the salmon on the waterfalls, um, the whales and eagles. I am taking my 100 to 400, uh, F4.5, F5.6, along with, I didn't put it up on the table, along with the uh, 1.4 teleconverter, which I have found to be a really nice combination. That gets me a 560. Uh, total reach, no real hit to image quality or autofocus speed, which I love, but I definitely take a big hit light. I think my fastest aperture I can do at 560 is F8. I think okay. that's correct. So definitely a hit there, but otherwise I've been really happy with that combo. And uh, the video that I just went out today, I just said it went out today. This lens along with me, uh, the Tamron 17 to 28. It's just such a nice, small, compact lens. I'm really happy about that. And I put it on the table, but I'm still on the fence. It's the 28 to 75. I might leave it at home. I might mm -hmm. take just the 17 to 35 and the 100. Uh, sorry, I keep doing that. 17 to 28 and the 100 to 400. I know that's a pretty big gap. So at the last minute, I might say, I don't want that big a gap, but I just feel like this 100 to 400 is going to be on my camera 90% of the time. And then I can make do with this wider angle for some other fun shots. So we'll see. I'm trying to be light. And then uh, the drone, uh, the uh, DJI Mavic Pro 2 or Mavic 2 Pro, whatever is the right order for that. Um, and a couple other little bits and stuff. Um, what won't be going 
is uh, these binoculars. <laughs> I I got these for the summer road trip. Tim just mentioned, you know, quite a pair of binoculars. I have wanted to try these forever because of this little button right here. It, these are image stabilization binoculars. So they have the same technology that our lenses have or, or some of our bodies. Um, well, I guess that's not true. Some of our lenses um, in that they stabilize. If you're holding it, you're looking at that little bird, you're trying to figure out what it is. Uh, you hold that button down and everything becomes a little bit steadier. Very and, nice. Um, yeah, the idea is cool. And forever I was like, oh my God, that must be the coolest thing. But um, they, as you can see, are huge. They are heavy and I found them to be not that much better than just a good pair of binoculars. Mm. So, yeah, sometimes you don't need the extra technology that they, that they put in there. Yeah. So I'm just going to put them back here. They're just right now a nice prop. That's really all they, they kind of remind me of the, like, you know, in star Wars, they've got these like oh, these yeah. binoculars. They, it looks kind of like those, but. I guess it's not the same ones that they use no. in Star Wars. No. Uh, it'd be <laughs> cool, though, if you had all that little extra stuff in there. That would be cool if you saw a little yeah. Tauntaun going by or something, and then you could stabilize it. Yeah. Yeah. Track it would it. be all shaky. Tell you. I want it to tell me what bird I'm looking at. Because exactly. sometimes, who knows? It's a little brown bird. I don't oh, know that's bird. coming up. You know what? AI is, I mean, that's a good thought. You know what? Even your camera. Maybe one day your camera will just be like, oh, I know what I'm looking mm -hmm. at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, to try to bring this back to some realistic stuff here, I have been photographing some animals in the wild occasionally over the last couple of weeks. Uh, these, uh, I just put a story up to say, come watch the show. It is a marmot from uh, Mount Rainier. And I did see IAF work on that marmot. It tried That's to walk awesome. on that little eye from time to time. And it's, it's pretty fun. Uh, there was some other animal, a goose. Yeah, a little goose uh, when I was on my vacation in Keystone. Um, you know, go to Colorado, photograph some Canada geese. That's what we did. Uh, but, uh, but the IAF worked. That's killer. Yeah. Yeah. That's killer. Yeah. Here, um, here's, yeah. here's just real quick. Here's the, uh, the 300 on the, on the D five. This is pretty much, you know, without the hood. I mean, that's a small lens. I mean, that's just not yeah. a whole lot. To, it, it doesn't even have a, a, a tripod color cause there's, you don't, it's got VR and you don't need, I mean, it's not big enough to, to need that. So yeah, that's what I'll be taking. Very cool. Very cool. All right. We're going to dive into the part of the show. It's one of our favorite parts of the show. It's where pen members have submitted to us an image or images. We're going to take a look at them. Most the, 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 the goal of this section is to really kind of give you some Lightroom tips and tricks. But of course, we give you some feedback on your image as well. I say it's mostly Lightroom tips and tricks because as pen members, you have a variety of ways to get feedback on your images. So we want this to be more a little bit more about Lightroom, which David and I use pretty extensively. So um, let's see, I have to share my screen. Oh, well, I'll be able to show you all the, um, let's see, Ooh, I need to, oh, things are bad. Hold on, I got it, we'll get there. It's better when I talk through it. <laughs> there we go. Okay, uh, here's the little marmot I was talking about uh, oh, yeah. and IAF just locked right on his little eye oh, and uh, I was pretty happy with that. Yeah. And uh, there was a bunch of chipmunks too, but, uh, I didn't get IAF to work successfully on those chipmunks. Those All right. Chipmunks. Man. I know. I know. Okay, here we go. So we got a couple of pictures here. We're going to, I think with the number of pictures we have, if you submitted more than one, we're just going to do one today. And Pam, I'll tell you up front, your second picture, um, well, you'll see in a minute. It was so small, Pam. We couldn't talk about it. It was this tiny little pixelated thing. But first up, we've got Sue's. Um, I think this is glass. I'm pretty sure that's not a plant. I think this is some kind of glass, maybe like the truly guy who blows those really cool glass designs. And uh, yeah, that definitely looks like glass to me. Okay, good, good. Glad we're on the same page there. Um, all right, first thing I, I do when I bring an image in, into Lightroom uh, is almost one of the first things I do. And David, I don't know what your preference is for order, but I crop pretty early on in the process. Uh, yeah because it, it 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 affects the histogram and i do use the histogram to a degree to kind of judge how to edit yeah yeah that's a good point i never really thought about it that it does mm -hmm. affect the histogram it depends for me i've found myself sometimes uh if i'm doing portraiture 
uh, I almost always crop at some point, but lately I've been cropping very, very last because I will go into Photoshop and do a ton of stuff to it. And then I'm kind of locked into whatever that crop was once mm -hmm. I was in Photoshop. So, but with a landscape or something kind of like this, some sort of nature or artistic kind of thing, I feel like if you already know that the stuff that's kind of on the edges, you kind of want to get rid of anyway, or some things, yeah, you might as well go ahead and crop it. Um, it just depends on the image for me. Yeah. Okay, good. And that's great. That's a great point of once you've gone to Photoshop and then you get that second version back, you're, you are stuck with that. So yeah, yeah, I can definitely see why I've learned, I've learned the hard way. Just, <laughs> oh man, I wish I could go back and you know, so yeah, but it depends. Some images, like I know right out of the gate, like, you know, sometimes you're taking a shot and you're like, I know that I'm not going to include all this because there's all this junk on the bottom, but I just want to do kind of this panoramic looking shot or a what, like sometimes we shoot things knowing that we're going to be cropping things out because we just, we can't zoom in anymore or we want to get the full width, but we don't want the, the, the top and bottom as much. So. Yeah, totally. Totally agree. So I, I made an early crop here. Um, I really feel like this, this trio of glass designs is the subject. And mm -hmm. so the other bits, they're just kind of extra and a little bit distracting, especially this bit of um, kind of totally different color uh, branch or twig that sticks up there. So that's, that's the first. We still have this one showing up down here, um, but we're going to ignore that for now. And I think I'm just going to... Well, maybe we can get away. Can we? It, do you feel like we truncate the bottom too much if we crop up to there? Um, I don't think so. Let me see. Um, no, I mean, I, I definitely agree about taking the, those elements out of the bottom. Um, mm -hmm. it, I, it, you know, you might even could come down on the top a little more. I don't know, just like a, just a smidge. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I, I've gotten in a habit of sometimes not cropping in a standard format too. I don't, I don't know if you were just cropping it at like a, you know, four by five. Yeah, I guess you were kind of locked into something, but uh, which makes it tricky when you go to print. But uh, sometimes the crop needs to be what the crop needs to be, no matter if it's fitting within a standard format or not. In my opinion, and, yeah. Uh, I think that that's another great point. You know, if you aren't going to print this, if this is going to be something you publish in your gallery or online, uh, Instagram, uh, crop it to whatever looks best and tells the story best. Don't don't be constrained to a two by three or a four by five um, or anything. Uh, you know, yeah. just do something that works best for the image. Yeah, yeah, and you know this this. Uh, the reason why I think Dave were on the same page here, we've kind of cropped in is because you really want to fill the frame with your subject and not get, you know, anything else um, that's kind of distracting. You use that term border patrol. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah. I, and I don't remember where I heard it uh, years ago, just some photographer friends of mine were talking about that. They were kind of critiquing some of my images. And uh, you know, I think a lot of times it's very easy to, 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 to look at the dead center of the image and kind of maybe the main subject. But one thing that I think is a really great uh, habit to get in for all of you is when you go to actually start editing your photo, I want you to look around the edges, just like follow, like just clockwise or whatever direction you want to go. Just follow around the whole frame and look at those edges and see if there's anything kind of on the border of that, of that, uh, of that frame. That's just a little, that kind of stands out. Maybe it's a little too bright or it just doesn't really, like I always use the the painting analogy, you know, I have this my thing I always use, but like if I was painting this picture, I probably wouldn't have um, that that kind of sprig that's kind of two thirds the way on the bottom, you know, you know, and that's not it's a you know, that was there. So when you shot this, Sue, it was I mean, that was just there. It's totally understandable. But um, when you when you go to edit, that's a time when you can try to take it out. And sometimes when you're shooting, you can kind of move a little bit to get some of those things out of the edges of your frame. But uh, that is really important, I think, because anything that's distracting around the edges will just kind of pull your eyes away from the main subject. And you don't want to do that. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so I think we've we've cropped in. This is our main subject. These three cool designs. Yes. And so I think filling the frame with those. And now this is a JPEG, but I, I think I'd bring exposure down just a tiny bit or maybe yeah. uh, a little bit and then highlights a little bit more. Yeah. Um, just, just to take some of that bright shine off of those. Um, but otherwise I think this is, this is pretty neat. And this is one of those shots where I wonder if you had backed up and zoomed in Sue, 
to get a little bit of a separation, a focal, uh, an aperture separation from the background. So at a little bit of a shallower depth of field here, where you start to make this background a little softer and make these things pop and really stand out. Uh, Sue, so you are a pen member, so you can go watch my tip on how to kind of highlight and make these stand out, but I'll, I'll show, I'll tease a little bit of it. Basically, I would get a little radial gradient like so, and then you could just um, lower texture and clarity, um, or not DA, sorry, turn O off, and things just get a little bit softer back there. We could actually lower saturation just a little bit, um, and just just a touch. Now these are pretty irregular shaped objects, so this is a little bit tricky, but that's the idea. And then you could duplicate this and throw it on the other ones, or you could do the reverse of it, throw on an inverted one that goes the other way, a little bit mm -hmm. more texture, a little bit more clarity, so that it just gets sharper and stands out from the background again. I'm, I'm going to move on, David, unless you have anything else to add. No, that's good. I think it's great. I, I will say, uh, Gareth was asking um, if we, before cropping, do we consider what the image ratio should be, like 3 to 2, 16, and 16 by 9? Um, it just depends. Again, like I said, sometimes I, I already know when I'm shooting. Even when I'm shooting it, I know that it's going to be a certain way. Sometimes I know I want to have a square photo. Um, but... Again, I, I think um, it just it does depend, but just be a little cautious in your cropping. If you're going to do it first, make sure that you really are willing to get rid of the things that you're taking out. If you if you have a lot of heavy lifting editing to do, then just make sure that you're, you're ready to to part ways with those parts because it's it's hard to go back and like fix those sometimes if they've already been excluded from the edit. Yeah. Yeah. And I see a little bit of discussion about thinking about if I know the destination, the Instagram Gareth is saying, I'll find myself in the field. And, and this disappoints me sometimes. I may have said this on the show already. There are times where I'm in the field shooting a vertical oriented image thinking, okay, I'm going to have to crop this so that it looks best on Instagram because you, you can't have an image taller than a five by seven, um, you know, aspect ratio um, in a vertical orientation. And I, that, I really am disappointed in myself when I think that because I'm like, why is Instagram dictating my yeah. art? <laughs> a little tiny image that yes. people just scroll past. Yeah. I will say I've been using, occasionally I'll use, there's an app called Square Fit. And mm -hmm. it's great because you can put your, whatever, like however tall the photo is, you can put it in Square Fit and it will create a new file uh, for Instagram that's cropped exactly how you want it. And it sometimes is a beautiful way to display an image because you'll have, it's almost like you have this, all this white space around the photograph. And I see a lot of photographers do that, like a lot of pros and it's, it's kind of a beautiful way to display a photograph. And then you're not killing the top or the bottom of the photo, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I like that app a lot. I don't use it all the time, but I, I, I do like it when, when yep. I need it. That is, that's a, that's a good point. And it gives you a little bit of more breathing room. Um, you don't have to feel like you have to crop. All right, we're going to move on. Roger submitted this. He We saw his finished product on Facebook. I was pretty impressed by it, but he wants us to take a closer look. Um, his point is he took the shot and he said, you know, I, I screwed up. Uh, it's overexposed. So I thought I would try to do something a little bit different with this. And here is his finished product. Wow. Which I just think is stunning. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. It uh, it reminds me a lot of the photographer. I think it's David Morrow who mm. is traveling the world, um, spending a lot of time in zoos because sadly that is where some of the most endangered species are. Um, and he is uh, photographing in, in incredible black and whites of all of these different animals all over the world. And he, and the shots are very studio like set up, which, you know, is, is interesting. You don't, that's not typical, your typical wildlife photography. Usually it's out there in the wild and you're capturing it, but these obviously are animals, um, in, in studios and they are stunning black and whites. And Roger, I think this is, uh, this isn't black and white, but I think you've done a really, really nice job here. That is awesome. I, you know, that just, guys, this just goes to show that uh, if you've captured the subject you wanted to capture and the gesture of the subject and the the moment, um, don't give up if it doesn't look, number one, if it doesn't look great, and number two, if it looks like it's completely unusable, it's amazing when you shoot raw how much you can, you can 
pull things out of the gutter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, of course, don't want you to get in a habit of shooting overexposed or underexposed photos, but you have leverage that you don't realize sometimes. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I was just curious. So Roger gave us the raw. I hit auto in Lightroom, which I've been using a fair amount lately to just to see how much it would recover right there. And mm. uh, I'm not that impressed with it. Um, but let's yeah, bring our highlights <laughs> down a little bit more. And I'm just curious. I don't think I really have much to add, uh, Roger, to your edits. Yeah, see, that's all there still. You just have to paint, work at it a little bit more. Global, uh, The global edits didn't get there, but the individual edits certainly do. Yeah. Um, the only thing is I feel like it's a little aggressive around this foot. I'd love to see just a little bit more. I'd bring that back up some. Yeah. I could that's, that. that's being pretty picky. Otherwise I think, um, really you've done a great yeah. job. Yeah. And that could even just be an artistic thing. You know, just, I wanted the foot to be a mm -hmm. little darker, but I do think it serves the photo maybe a little better to brighten that up a touch, but what a cool way to just make this there's a drama to it. You know, it looks like you were in a studio with this bird and, and lit it with a studio strobe. I mean, it's, it's yep. really wonderful. Yeah. Nicely done. Nicely done, Roger. All right, we're going to move on. Uh, we're going to skip Sue's. We'll probably get to that next show. Sue, we're going to try to do just one from each person and we've got Pam's. Um, oh, cool. Hi. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Do you want me to lead on this one? Ah, uh, sure. Go ahead. Um, that's, wow. That's a cool scene. Um, and I like this, this attempt at sort of a wide shot that you did. Um, you know, the kind of panoramic, almost panoramic kind of shot. Um, I think you exposed it really well. Um, I think you, you've got the, the, the I don't know what you call this thing, a house, whatever the structure is. Mm -hmm. Um, You've, I think you've got it in, in what I think is the right spot. Um, it's I, 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 the only things that stand out to me first off are, I think perhaps the tree on the left, you probably could have maybe taken that out altogether or just only put a little bit. I don't know. It just depends, but it's, it, it almost feels a little superfluous in my opinion to the, to the rest of the photo. Um, like almost like you don't need it to tell the story. Um, but I always caution, I always want to use caution when I make a critique like that. Cause it's just, that might've been the way you wanted to, to show it. I, it just, the, I would see it more like this maybe, and maybe even bring in the right side in. Cause there's kind of a crowd of people on the right. And, um, it's, uh, but yeah, there's that. And then the only other thing I really saw initially that kind of stood out was the, the pine needles in the bottom, uh, they're kind of right at the bottom of the of the uh, of the frame. I feel like a distraction. Feel like you probably wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't have put that in if you were just kind of creating this from your imagination. And so, if you can take it out, uh, which you know, uh, yeah. Lightroom sometimes can handle that, and sometimes it can't. Um, it can handle anything. You just have to. It's how much do you want to work at it? But yeah, a little Photoshop would would really clean it up. But I, to me, it just simplifies that scene a little bit because it's such a beautiful scene with the reflection, the trees, the the rocks. Yeah. 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 I think that's good. Yeah. It's a little, a little messy down there. Um, but I just wanted to do that quick. I agree totally um, with you and the tree. I think you can use objects in the frame and sometimes it's natural framing devices, but they really need to not be kind of in your face. They need to just kind of force your view and this, out of focus, big tree just kept grabbing me away. Um, yeah, it kind of did me too. And, yeah. you know. Yeah. And then I think when we we look at cropping that tree out, I think we've really started to fall nicely on the rule of thirds with our, um, I'm going to yeah. call it a pagoda. I have no idea if that's right, but it looks like kind of what a pagoda is maybe. I don't know. So let's throw this uh, in there. And, um, and then we just kind of have it balanced by this little bit of an island that's more in the foreground here. And I think that's pretty nice. Yeah. 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 I might white balance wise, see if I put a teeny bit. Now this is a JPEG, so it's not going to respond to white balance adjustments very well, but I might a little blue, just, I might add a little blue, a little cool it down just a little bit. Yeah. Um, but otherwise I'm pretty nice. Yeah. I, I, I like it. I mean, th there's so many different ways you can play with a, a photo like that. And, and like we've said in, in previous episodes and, you know, you, you, 
there's a lot of stuff you can do in editing, but one of the the biggest challenges for all of us, and I know for myself, big time, is thinking about the shot before I even take it, and um, really looking through the frame and seeing what like what's in that shot. Do I want everything that's in it? Can I move a little bit? If I can't, you know, sometimes you are where you are and you can't move, and that's fine. You know, don't not take the shot. Um, and we have the capability now to take things out and to move things a little bit. And, uh, mm -hmm. I, I see no harm in doing that. So yeah, yeah. It, it's a cool, it's a cool little shot you got here. Yeah. Uh, thank you chat room and Pam's in chat too. This is Kinkajuki. I'm sure I'm saying that exactly right. The golden pavilion in Kyoto, Japan. It's a Buddhist temple ah. also from Tom chiming in. Thank you guys. Uh, so cool. yeah, very, very cool. Um, and so I threw up a graduated filter across the bottom with a little bit more blue. I, I like, I feel like water should tend towards blue often unless it's got some other cool color. And I, I don't know, I just, I like it a little bit more cooled down. I'd probably come in now with an edit brush and uh, bring it back off these tree trunks a bit. But otherwise, you know, I think it blends very nicely into the rocks and, you know, this is a little bit blue, but. You could take it back off if you want. You hit the O key and it shows you that overlay and then you can see where you're painting. Auto mask off because we don't really care too much about this. It can be kind of sloppy with this is, um, if you wanted the rocks to still have a little bit of warmth to them. But yeah. Yeah, that's a good call though. I mean, that's definitely something I think is important. It's Lightroom gives you these very broad stroke tools sometimes and I love them, but you got to be careful because you don't want to you don't want to sabotage other parts of the photo just because it's easier to drag a gradient up. Cause you know, sometimes people will go in and literally paint in on every part where they want the color to be different or the brightness. And, um, it's more tedious and it's really nice to be able to pull a slider and just pull something down from, from the top, bottom, left, right. Um, but yeah, you know, really, really look at your images and, and make sure your things are speaking the way you want them to in, in color and, uh, texture, light, all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Pam, uh, thank you for paying attention and listening. Uh, I was, you, she said, are you referring to Joel Sator's uh, photo arc project? And that is correct. I'm not David Morrow. He's David Morrow is also a fantastic photographer, but it is Joel. I don't know if I'm saying his last name correctly, but uh, if you Google Joe Sartoris uh, photo arc, you will see those amazing black and white pictures similar to Rogers Pelican. Hmm. All right, we're moving on to Heather's Joshua Tree uh, picture. Um, she was on our trip, David. This is from our Joshua Tree workshop a couple, yeah. uh, a couple of weeks or a month or so ago. I remember Heather. Yeah. Uh, so first thing I want to do, I've been doing this a lot. It might make some people cringe. I don't know if I've really gotten your opinion on it, David Carr. That is hit the auto button and see what happens. Yeah, I mean, why not? I I feel like, um, I mean, the why not used to be, well, because Lightroom did a terrible job and I never agreed with its edits. These days, though, with the updates they've done, I feel like their edits are really a, usually a pretty good starting point. Yeah, absolutely. So um, uh, it's something you all might want to try. Try it. Let me know. A chat room who's watching, say does it make you cringe to hit the auto button? Are you a purist? You need to move every little slider yourself. Let's see. Okay. Very cool. So what's the subject here? I think it's these yellow flowers kind of framed by the rocks in the background. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's kind of neat way we have this arc of yellow flowers and then we have this kind of arc of, you know, vertical funky rocks that, that say Joshua tree. Yes. So I'm just going to kind of keep doing this. And again, I feel like this disclaimer, it's similar to kind of the one that you mentioned, David Carr is we're not saying that this is what you should do every time in Lightroom is crop the crap out of your pictures. But out in the field, you should start thinking about, hey, what, what is my subject? What do I really want to fill the frame with? And start, you know, using your focal length and your positioning to achieve the same effects. And then, of course, yeah. in Lightroom, you can like refine it a little bit. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think it's better. I mean, to me, when the sky is sort of... Uh, 
there's nothing exciting happening in the sky except for those streaks of kind of purple and orange and blue that you know you're still including there but once you get kind of above those rocks a little bit it, it all it's all just kind of white and you have you have so much cool texture going on with all of these rocks and the flowers that it yeah it almost behooves you to just sort of really concentrate on that and let the other stuff kind of go away um it just depends again. I mean, sometimes you have to step way back from your photograph and look at it as just one whole thing and not try to nitpick anything and just ask yourself, does it, is it just, is it, are things in the right place or is it zoomed in enough? Is it zoomed out enough? I don't know. It's that's subjective, but there is sort of like a set of kind of rules with within like that. I think that work for most people. And you know, to me, like, kind of cropping in like this i i think i like it better yeah okay good uh i threw another graduated filter across the top i use the luminance range mask to kind of peel it off the rocks so really just the sky and really uh brought the uh, temp the tint the tint up to kind of help emphasize that banding of color that i remember in the sky and that we have yeah. kind of that tease of that you mentioned um and this is another spot where, you know, we've got, uh, this is another one of our participants. I'm blanking on the name right now, but Heather, I would have loved for you to waited a moment until he was hidden behind this stuff because he is distracting. But yeah, um, definitely. But it still, it still is a beautiful shot. And then I would, I'd probably get a brush and uh, maybe a little bit of exposure, a little bit warmer a little bit of texture, clarity, and just kind of brush it on these guys and make them stand out. Nice. Just a bit. Now I'm being sloppy and you can see the uh, kind of editing back there where it's bleeding over onto the rocks in the background. I don't actually want that. So you do have to be careful, but um, just to kind of make them pop and stand out a little bit more. Yeah. And you know, uh, Heather, you, you can technically take the, the the i can't remember his name either I, I wish i could remember but you could take that out in photoshop i mean it is possible it's, it takes some work mm -hmm. um you could take that i think it looks like a folding chair that's off to the left but mm -hmm. you know try when you're when you're shooting to just just try to think of you know find anything in this shot that's going to be sort of distracting that's not really part of the story and either wait for that to not be there or just know that you're going to have to do a little bit of heavy lifting on the editing um but uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it was a beautiful time of day to shoot and you got a great subject there. It's it, yeah, it's, it's a really cool scene. Let's see real quick. I right clicked edit in Photoshop and uh, uh, let's just see edit content aware fill and um, see what it does. I typically um, don't really do much to that part where it's asking and um, it's not so good. Yeah, that sometimes it's hit or miss. Sometimes it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Other times you're like, what did it just do? Yeah, but it, it's, you know, it's kind of a decent start point there. Yeah, there it go. is. And then maybe we take this and a little bit of bush instead of chair. And over here, it's a little funny. I would even take that black darkness kind of in the bottom left corner out. I would just... All right, down there? Yeah, just kind of... Yeah. That's one of those border patrol things I was talking about where I, I feel like that that streak of black there just I don't know it just doesn't it's not consistent with the rest of the photo and even though it's natural it to me it just looks better without it I don't know why it just does <laughs> yeah no I agree and uh, that went back in quick so after I did the content aware fill I just switched over to the uh, clone stamp tool the s yeah and uh, hey you know not bad. not bad for i mean you know that's like a two, that's just like a quick showing you how to do it if you if you really fine tune that it's going to look great yeah yeah um and uh let's go to kevin walks uh red rocks amphitheater hey david carr you've you've played here i have yes uh gosh four years ago almost exactly played a concert there and uh in it was in june and uh it was unbelievable. 
It was just such a cool place. It uh, it, it is awesome. I've been twice now, uh, both times just during the day, but it happened that the last time I was there, there was an acapella group uh, doing their sound check. So, oh, that's cool. <laughs> kind of, sort of, got to see a performance. Yeah, um, that's cool. But it, it is an amazing place. I can't imagine how cool it is to play or to see a, you know, the play is, is a whole nother level, but to just see a kind of a good show that you like here would be really cool too. Yeah, it was, it, it was surreal. I mean, and it was sold out. So it was even better. Like it just the view from the stage is just like unbelievable. Then, you know, it's called red rocks for a reason, but there, there are on either side of the, the, the stands there, there, there are these just huge monolithic rocks that are just gorgeous and they're all lit up at night and yeah, if, if you can get out there to see a show, it's definitely worth it. Yeah, yeah. All right, um, so this is Kevin Walks, uh, Red Rocks. It looks like um, it was quiet late evening time. First thing I want to know is, does Late Room think it's straight? Oh, so this auto button I have been uh, pressing today a couple of times because I had a couple of wide angle shots from her local library that has a lot of fun angles. And this auto button as part of the crop tool failed me every single time uh -huh. today. I thought it would do better on this, but apparently not. So I think I'm looking at that far distant horizon and I think something like that. It was close to level, but now I think it's a little closer. Yeah, that looks better. Um, and I, I've, it, it, when it did that uh, auto level, it cropped in on all sides a little bit. I am fine with that. Um, maybe I'll come back out a little bit. But foreground wise, you know, I don't think that that really adds anything there. So we'll bring that back yeah. a bit. So eight seconds, F11, F2.8. I wonder, Kevin, why you chose F2.8 if it seems like you were on a tripod at eight seconds. I th um, maybe you're trying to get a little stars from above. I don't know. I think I would have gone to an even longer shutter speed and a, a, a wider aperture that probably, or sorry, a, a more narrow aperture that would have given you a little more depth of field. Um, but then let's, let's get a graduated filter down here and see if we can get this foreground to be a little bit more um, lively. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere around there. And again and again, I'm amazed. All I did was throw this uh, graduated filter on and how nicely it, you know, kind of um, graduates out, you know, how yeah. nicely I don't have to worry about erasing over these edges. It just kind of fits in the scene here. I use that tool all the time and sometimes very subtly, but just, just enough to there it's in, in a lot of images, it's really important to have sort of an even spread of light. Um, and, and that, that could be argued against, but I think for a lot of landscape kind of images, you don't want to have one part of the image, like really bright and the other part really dark. It's usually, you kind of want there to be this even flow to it all. And it's great to have the contrast and have highlights and shadows, but you, if if one whole side of the photo or one you know the, the top half the bottom half is way brighter than the other it just it, it doesn't look complete in my opinion um yeah. but i think what you're doing you know and i, I know you're using broad strokes here but that's yeah. you get you know it's you're bringing it into a little bit more of like a even toned even exposed uh, uh photo yeah yeah uh, way too much color there but yeah all right so pen members who submitted images, thank you so much for submitting. Uh, I gotta stop screen sharing now. Um, you know, I know it's not always fun putting your work out there in front of folks, but obviously you, you found it useful or I hope you found it useful. Obviously you have in the past, that's why you submitted images to us. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and uh, we're gonna move on. We got a couple of new stories to touch on. And, and I led off with this at the beginning of the show. I said, Sony's had a baby A9. Uh, and that is their RX Mark. What are they up to? Seven? I got to pull the show notes up because I don't even remember. <laughs> I reviewed the um, six last year. Uh, yeah, it is the seven. So the RX seven, um, I reviewed the six last year at Mount Rainier. Actually, I walked around with it. What they, the big news they made with the six was in a pocketable point and shoot camera, they put a 24 to 200 lens. 
uh, maybe it's a 28, it, you know, but it's impressive. It was good enough to photograph the marmots. Uh, Mama Grouse with some babies or a ptarmigan, I think she was actually a ptarmigan, walked across the trail and having 200 millimeters in my pocket um, was uh, pretty handy. They've taken it to the next level with the RX-7. It offers 90 frame per second bursts of images. That is 90 images in a second. That's impressive. Uh, and it has the Sony A9 level autofocus performance. And it's got a mic jack, finally. So really, this little pocketable point and shoot has some of the most capable autofocus systems on the market, similar to flagship level DSLRs. Now, it's not going to give you that level of quality because it is just a one inch sensor, but it still is pretty impressive. And it does still offer that 24 to 200. It has a little pop up electronic viewfinder, it's got a full flip up touchscreen, um, and it is a newly developed. 20 megapixel, one inch sensor. So uh, it can do blackout free 20 frames per second. So that's a lot of good news. The bad wow. news is none of these cameras ever come cheap. Um, I think this one is being priced at what, 1300? I think 1298, if I remember correctly. 1200. It's going to ship in August for a cool $1,200, which, you know, if you are an interchangeable lens shooter. Most of you watching the show probably have a camera that has lots of lenses. That that 1200 bucks is a quite a nice lens. Or you can go for a pocketable point and shoot like this. Chat room, is it something that's exciting for you? Uh, what do you think? Uh, it also does 4K video. Um, and th the video quality uh, is just really, really impressive. The image quality is really impressive too. And it has this more of an active steady shot stabilization system. Um, so, you know, Sony continues to iterate this camera for a long period of time. I've been very positive about these cameras, but I also say that their price, I really struggle to say I'm going to carry one around when I have my cell phone. But then when they came out with a six that offers that incredible amount of zoom, so, well, now, you know, that's something that your cell phone can't do, or your smartphone, I should say. True. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Could be cool. But yeah, it, it's always a toss up with these smaller cameras. I mean, I, uh, it, we always, we're always battling like lightweight versus heavy and, you know, portability, but versus quality. Like, it's always a toss up. And, uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it is tough when you're when you've got to spend that much money to get something like that, you know. Um, but it sounds like they're they've made a pretty impressive camera as far as the feature set goes. They have, they have. But uh, you know, you pay for it. So. You do, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Let's move on. It's not in the show notes, but I wanted to talk just uh, just a moment about this um, a, a DJI gadget that I don't like. Um, and that is the little pocket Osmo. I know this thing's been out for a while. We actually had one at launch and I had my video guy, Kaz. I was like, hey, Kaz, you're really in the video world. Why don't you take this thing and see what you can do with it and make a review about it? Uh, he actually made a really cool shoot short story. We should at least publish that. But he started to get into the review part of it. And he was like, you know, I just don't really like it. And 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 he's not a YouTuber, so he felt really bad saying, I don't, I said, like, I don't want to do the video. I was like, all right, don't worry about it. And then I was like, you know what? Kaz doesn't know what he's doing. I'm going on a road trip. This thing looks like the perfect gadget to, to record my road trip. I'm going to pick one up. Um, and I agree with Kaz. I don't really like it. <laughs> it's such a cool idea. Stabilize a little gimbal, make some footage, get some footage. But man, I really struggle to find a huge difference from holding the phone in kind of a careful fashion a lot of the time. And so then it's like, it's another gadget to keep track of, to get footage off of. And there are certainly benefits. And I think there is, I, I think that there is a group of people out there that this will work well for. But for your occasional, like traveling around and doing stuff, just use your cell phone. Yeah, it's getting to be more and more that way, and it will continue to get more and more that way. The phone is just dominating that space of 
yeah image capturing yeah um and you know shiznut says make art uh did a good video uh, oh make art now is that a youtube channel did a good video on how to use it and get great results okay i definitely think you can do some really cool stuff with this but you 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 got to kind of have a plan and if you're just going out and uh trying to capture little clips of smooth footage and stuff like that again i think um just use your phone but you can. Uh, I did see somebody's video. I don't know if it was uh, Make Art Now, but he like taped it to a pole. And then you have this really cool boom pole that gave you shots that were almost drone-like, but of course, very smooth and at a much cheaper price. And of course, you don't have to worry about crashing a drone. Um, but that's all kind of dedicated stuff that you got to say, hey, this is what I'm going to buy it for. This is what I'm going to do for it. And if you're just thinking of like going around and capturing vacation footage, I'm going to say it again. Just use your phone. So. Yeah. Um, but, and, uh, pick wants to know what the MSRP is for this right now. What does it cost? I think it's three 99. Uh, so it's a little pricey. Uh, and you know, I would as much as, and I feel similar about the GoPros and things like that to a degree, but what's nice about a GoPro is get it underwater, not worry about it, strap it to your helmet very easily. So there's a lot of other ways to use it, but there are also a lot of people that buy GoPros that I think you'd be fine just using your phone. If you're not if you're not jumping out of planes often or going underwater often, then just use your phone. But um, yeah, so you know, I just I just think for the cost right now, it's just a little bit limited. So yeah, okay. Um, let's move on. A couple quick. Uh, all right, we're supposed to have two more Sony cameras announced. You know, they just announced the A7R4, uh, a follow up to the, my A7R3, which I love. So that'll be interesting. And then we've got two more coming in August and September. One of those should be the A7S3, should be a killer video camera. I don't know what the other one is. Possibly. Maybe, maybe it's the A7R5. They're just going to go ahead and <laughs> really kick Canon and Nikon in the tail. <laughs> yeah. And everybody who's bought the R4 is going to Everybody, like, oh, yeah. Right, right. We're just going to go ahead and release everything we've been working on. Yeah. Here you go. Here's it all. Yeah. Uh, Sony has, has done that in the past. Very, very close with the A6300. And then the 6500 came out less than a year later. Really? Wow. Um, yeah, they, and the 6500 yeah. had stabilization and all the 6300s were like, wait, what? <laughs> so it's hard not to get a little hurt when that happens. But you yeah, know, we said this last week on the show, camera bodies are not an investment, folks. You're no, not, you know, definitely not. No. Um, but the other one might be speaking of the A6500, it might be a more uh, robust uh, APS-C line of camera, which would be very exciting because I think the A6400 is a fantastic camera at its price point, but I am getting tired of those cramped little bodies and that battery life that just is okay. I would love to see them say, hey, you know, we are going to beef up this APS-C line and uh, go ahead and let you put a bigger battery in it, have a little bit better control. You know, I, I the, the whole A6, the A6000 is a fantastic value. But I do struggle a little bit to recommend it to very beginners who are interested in really learning photography because of its cramped control scheme. It's not very manual friendly. So I would love to see a more manual friendly camera. And then I think they'd really dominate in that space. And two or no, a professional level Canon mirrorless body is on its way. Uh, that headline sounds very exciting, but then you read it and the latest rumors are in time for next year's Summer Olympics. Uh, which uh, that's almost a year away. <laughs> I mean, th there was the talk from Canon that there was going to be a professional one this year. I mean, not Canon has said that, but but I guess that was been the rumor mill. It's looking less and less likely. Um, so we'll see. Gosh, by that point, Sony will have, I mean, dominated all the more. <laughs> <laughs> and then, well, and, you know, Nikon, we don't have it on our list, but we mentioned it last week just to kind of round out the uh, ecosystem of cameras we're talking about. Nikon's supposed to be possibly releasing a very budget-friendly uh, full-frame mirrorless. Yeah, that's what I keep hearing. We'll yeah. see. We'll see. Could be good. Yeah. Uh, so my workshop this weekend, eight participants and only one photographer used a DSLR. Everybody else is mirrorless. Wow. Four Sony, two Fuji, uh, one, that doesn't add up, one DSLR. Oh, and Monica with a Nikon Z6. Wow. So there you go. 
So yeah, it's the tide's turning, man. I, I got to tell you, I mean, I, so I have the Z6, uh, love it and it's not perfect, but I love it. And, but then I have two DSLRs and I just keep, I keep reaching for the Z6. There's just something about the instant gratification of looking in the viewfinder, uh, and seeing exactly what I'm going to shoot and then seeing it in the viewfinder. Once I've shot it, if it's super bright outside, you know, you don't have to sit there and battle the sun when you're trying to look at the back of your screen. And just i don't know it just feels like it's the future and so yeah uh are you taking the z6 to um that's yeah. the debate for me is because i i do want to take it but then i don't know <laughs> i know i know you you get limited room in the bag yeah and, and i'm spoiled because i have three great cameras and i you know i don't want to be like woe is me i can't decide which one you know it's like oh i don't i can't decide if i want to drive the porsche the ferrari or the bentley like i'm not trying to be like that but it's just very it's you know it's kind of like i don't want to get there and be like ah i really wish i had x but i also don't want to take everything i own and be like how am i going to get this on this little plane yeah yep exactly first world problems yeah and i i said this i think i said this to you before the show began let me tell the rest of you in chat room you can tell me if i'm crazy or if you're not watching this live leave a few comments love to read those comments i'm thinking about not taking a backup camera to alaska uh just my a7r3 uh, and as i say that it really does make me kind of nervous but I might at the last minute take, I have the A7R2 as well. That's actually what I'm using to stream the show, feed the show. Um, I, maybe I'll take that. Yeah. Uh, it seems silly to go on a trip of this level and not have a backup in case. Um, yeah, it's a toss up. It's, I don't know. I think I've said it's a toss up about 50 times on this <laughs> podcast or this, uh, this broadcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Gareth says, no, always have a backup. It, I mean, it's true. We tell the clients to, we've seen it happen. Uh, Alaska can have some harsh weather. Although I have, look at my, my think tank rain poncho for my camera. No harsh weather is going to get to that A7R3. My little window, little hands. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, but maybe I should take a backup. <laughs> Yeah. So, well, let me know. Let me know in the chat. And also, as Roy just reminded you, if you're watching the show and and uh, you think I should have a backup, give it a little thumbs up. If you think David should take his Z6 to Tanzania, uh, give the show a thumbs up. Um, and give the show a thumbs up uh, because we're going to show you what. Uh, <laughs> I, actually, I'm not going to preface it. I'm just going to here prepare yourself for this. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is some good Photoshop. So professional photographer Amy Hale of Coffee Creek Studios uh, recently put some of her newborn portraits through Face App to, to create a hilarious of mildly unsettling series of images titled If Babies Had Teeth. So if you uh, the Face App was what everybody's using to make themselves old um, and also to uh, share their picture with a Russian organization. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I did um, my research on that. Yeah, but it also, and, and I did it. Yep, I did it too. Um, uh, it also has a smile function where it'll take a somebody's picture who's not smiling and, and give them some fake teeth to make them look smiling. And here they are. Um, oh my gosh. We saw that one already. Right. Oh, boy. oh. They, yeah. they work so well. They do. I mean, <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> it's what? like chucky kind of level stuff though i mean this yeah is... it is it is wow. this some of these could could haunt you a bit yeah um it's just not right oh, oh my gosh oh. i mean some babies already look like a shrunken old person with good skin um yeah. and the teeth just bring it home yeah that is so uh if any of you need counseling after this i'm sorry <laughs> uh, we're just gonna move on now. we don't provide that service those were pretty funny uh and then let's let's go to the other stuff section and uh seven tips to help you get out of a creative rut we want to talk about that a little david yeah that's it's great i i mean as i was reading the show notes i was thinking yeah that would be a good one to uh just to touch on because I, th I think, you know, and I was, I was telling Toby before we started the, the broadcast, um, I, I think my first instinct is to think that 
a landscape photographer is not going to get in a creative rut because you go out and you just shoot the landscape that's there. You're not trying to, you know, you're not in a studio trying to come up with some new thing that no one's ever seen before and try to create some really unique style that's all your own. Usually with landscape, you're trying to kind of emulate what was there and give it some drama. But I don't think that's totally true. I think we can get in a, in a creative rut um, where everything kind of has the same feel. And sometimes that's not serving us well. And um, I don't know. I, I have actually not read this article, How to the, the Seven Tips. I need to read that, actually. But uh, I, I know that it can be a, a real struggle for every artist. And I think one way to do that is to just do a personal project where you're just just doing it for yourself. You're not even trying to impress anybody with it and just just really try some crazy stuff that you haven't done before and and don't be afraid to for it to be to, you know don't be afraid for it to suck <laughs> and just uh because th that's how you're gonna know like you know what it actually was really cool when i did x y and z that was i didn't think it would be you know whether that might be something in editing that might be something in uh maybe you're doing panoramas a certain way or i, I don't know um but yeah. it is very easy to get stuck. Yep. Yeah, totally. And, you know, we've been doing this show for a while. This this first tip of kind of focus on the creative. We, we've touched on this in the past. We've heard stories. What people will do is say, well, I'm going to go try this crazy project, kind of like what you're suggesting. And out of it, um, somebody notices their work and says, hey, I, I want you to come do this for, for me for yeah. X, Y, or Z. Or... Like you said, maybe they create something and it totally sucks, but there's still education and learning that comes out of that. Like, oh, you know, uh, you, um, Definitely. Uh, you know, Roger's picture. I'm not telling you go shoot a bunch of overexposed animals and then turn them into a, a kind of amazing stylistic images. But, you know, through mm -hmm. through these kind of trials and tribulations, we're going to be learning. So that is that first tip, uh, you know, just focus on the creativity for a while do fun things that you enjoy and you aspire um and uh then this uh should keep the photography a little bit more fun and come back to reward you down the road number two stop comparing yourself to others very and good such such a uh, so easy to do these days we're sitting on instagram or looking oh look at that picture oh look at that picture yep. and um you know, it's just very easy to kind of feel like um, they're all better than you and that what they're doing is easy. So you really have to set that aside. I don't know how to, though. See, we've got this advice. I'll be honest, though. How do you actually do it? You just say to myself, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it, comparing yourself to others. I mean, I do it. I do it all the time. I mean, I cannot tell you how many times I've seriously thought for a moment, like, I think I need to just hang it up. I mean, like <laughs> the competition out there is uh, it, like, there are some just amazing, amazing photographers who actually aren't even well known at all. They're just really good. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I don't think you need to give it up yeah. because of that. I think you need to just, but that, you know, I, I read a thing today about competing with others. When you compete with, when you're always competing with others, you, you, you get discouraged and it, your creativity can suffer. But when you compete with yourself, like look at your best work, the things you're, you're the most proud of, and then try to beat those. Mm. And I think that's a better way to like, don't compare your stuff to everybody else. Cause everybody's got a different style. Some people have different proficiency. Some people have different access to, or better access to really cool places to photograph, but take the things that you do well and just keep in improving on those that's to me the, the best way to build your confidence yeah yeah uh and you know i think uh the kind of the secondary to that is uh you, you said it but i want to just summarize to say compare yourself to yourself look at where you've come from uh so often you go back and look at if you want to use instagram again as an example look at your early posts on instagram and you should see improvement over the years and you know have realistic expectations of of the speed of which you are going to improve as well uh keeping perspective is key uh we're painfully aware of all of our shortcomings, and sometimes the more we stare at our work the more we start to critique our work sometimes it's really helpful to ask a friend or a fellow creator for some constructive criticism of our work to realize that a lot of the time the shortcomings we might be obsessing about are mostly in our head um, I will say that's totally true for me producing YouTube videos. I am almost always, as I'm editing or shooting or writing scripts, 
uh, saying, oh, somebody's going to be annoyed about this point or someone's going to pick at this point. And it's so extremely rare that that's what people are frustrated about with the videos. It's usually something completely else. And so you should do the same thing with your with your art. You might be obsessing over some details and show it to folks. And it's important as other creative folks, not your mom. My mom thinks all of my pictures are great. <laughs> the, tr the truth is they're not. Um, well, you know, that's definitely, I think we have to, to, if we're going to take critique or, or try to get honest opinions about our work, I mean, you do need to go to people that aren't going to just always tell you that you're great. Cause mm -hmm. I mean, I post something on Instagram, Facebook, and it's like, Oh, this is so amazing. And I'm appreciative of that, but I don't always agree. I just put it out there thinking, well, you know, I'm excited about it, but it, there's, I don't know. I think you have to, you have to know who you're, uh, presenting it to and, and, and be thankful for people that give you those boosts of confidence and give you the compliments. But at the same time, it's good to, uh, like the, those of you who submit your work to, to these, um, critiques for us. I mean, that's, it takes a little bit of, um, I don't know. You have to, you have to be bold to do that. You have to, it's, it, it's brave, you know, um, because you don't want to hear somebody rip it apart or even tell you stuff you don't want to hear, but I think that's how we grow. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. All right, uh, let's uh, let's kind of get for the rest of these. Um, is this really how you say a, a, is that how you sell assesses assess your that looks like it says asses to me <laughs> asses your strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I, I isn't there an s? Shouldn't there, yeah, there should be another s there. It's something, yeah. Who, who is who is choosing these articles? Who is proofreading this stuff? All right, sit but, down, asses. No, sit down and try. <laughs> yeah, sit down on your asses, okay? <laughs> um, sit down on your asses and assess your strengths and your weaknesses. Um, try your best to be realistic. Look at your work objectively, object objectively. Yeah, that works. Um, and that's good. Okay, step out of your comfort zone. I kind of think we were talking about this at the first one of finding a project uh, that is interesting and different and unique, um, and from that you'll you'll learn. Even though, here, let's just kind of bleed into this next one. Even though you might make a bunch of mistakes trying a new creative project outside your comfort zone, it's very unlikely if you move outside your comfort zone that you're going to be a complete master of whatever you're trying right away. You're going to make some mistakes. Don't worry about it. That's yeah. a great way to learn. Absolutely. May, I mean, I welcome failure, and I don't mean that to say I want to fail, but I welcome any, I mean, anytime something doesn't work, I, I'm frustrated and then I'm thankful for that moment that taught me, okay, this didn't work. Now, you know, yeah. you know, it's, it's actually, it can be a really wonderful thing. Um, if you let it. Yeah. And then finally take a break from time to time, you know, give yourself that, uh, um, kind of allow yourself to not produce for a period of time. I think as humans, we, to, to stay at a certain level is very difficult. And so you, you're certainly welcome to take breaks from time to time. All right. Very that was cool. it. That was it. We got a lot more subjects. Maybe we should touch on this one. Stranger Things. They, oh, yeah. <laughs> the, there, there is a scene um, where the, what, the older brother is uh, developing film uh, yep. from time to time. And uh, somebody posted and said, What's this dude doing? He's like going in this room with a red light. He's putting his pictures in water and somehow that makes him better. <laughs> and then everybody on the internet felt old. Basically. Oh gosh. Yeah. I mean, it definitely, I mean, you think about how long digital photography has been around. It's been quite a minute. I mean, and, uh, yeah, but that show, I, I thought that was, that was great just to see that it literally like somebody, you know, if you don't know, you don't know. I mean, I don't really get upset with somebody, but it's just, wow, it did show just how far removed we are from that. Even though people still shoot on film and still work in a dark room, it's, uh, um, but I got to say that show has done a great job. Of, I, I really feel like, um, I was telling my, one of my sons yesterday that, uh, the eighties, you know, sometimes the, the way it's depicted in, in movies and TV shows is it's a little too cliche in, in certain ways. And they did play on a lot of the cliches but it really kind of does feel like the 80s to me when i watch that show there's something mm -hmm. about the vibe of it and mm -hmm. part of it is because they filmed it a, a lot of it they filmed in my town so i recognize things and then i the the houses 
the terrain, the sky, everything looks just like what I see every day. So it just, mm. it reminds me of where I live. So maybe the, the eighties thing just is all the more. So it, yeah, you had that connection to the, the place and also the eighties is pretty, I mean, I think we're similar age. The eighties is kind of our childhood. Yeah. Um, and absolutely. so, yeah, interesting, interesting. Yeah. Uh, I've only watched a couple episodes. It's too scary for me. <laughs> It's a little freaky. I mean, it's they 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 do a good job of 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 taking it to the sci-fi scary place, but not horror movie scary place. I feel, um, but it's a it, it yeah. it's a little heavy at times. I'm I'm fine admitting I'm a sissy. I, I could probably watch it. I just I just don't need to. I like the I, story though. This I, I can't watch a horror movie to save my life. So, uh, you know. Yeah. I can watch Stranger Things. Good. Okay. It's good to know. All right, we're gonna move on. Um, and uh, go right to Q and A. Uh, Andrew wants to know: Can you set up a site and save it without a subscription on Squarespace? Did I say it? on Squarespace? Can you set up a site and save it without a subscription? Andrew, you can set up a site without a subscription. You got a 14-day free trial, no credit card required. Uh, at the end of 14 days, that site will no longer be public. It is still accessible to you. Uh, but you have limited access to it unless you start paying for the subscription. Um, that is just the only way to do that. Uh, I, there's no way to kind of, you can export. Let's say you put a bunch of blog posts up during your 14 day free trial. You can export that content and import it to other sites, uh, but not the whole site itself. They don't give you a way to do that. Gareth wants to know, why would you need to use the white balance bracketing function on the camera? That's a good question. Not all cameras offer that, but many do offer a white balance bracketing where it will basically take a series of shots, three, sometimes five, at various white balance settings. And I think, Gareth, you're asking, why would you need to do that if you're shooting raw? Because the white balance is completely changeable after the fact with no real penalty. And my answer is, I really think you would only do it if you were shooting JPEG. Hmm. I can't see any other reason. No, I can't either. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then Larata wants to know what about the Tamron lens for video? I haven't shot video with it yet. I was really interested in putting that video, the video I put out about uh, the photos and astrophotography. I will be shooting some video with it um, in the coming weeks. And so I probably will be sharing more thoughts and opinions about that. Maybe another video, or maybe I'll just uh, append to the uh, blog post on uh, photorec.tv that talks about it. So, but it's similar to 2875, it's got good quiet autofocus so i suspect that it's going to be just fine yeah um yeah okay i think we're at the end of the show all right uh sad news uh with those trips that david and i just mentioned neither of us are going to be around for quite a while uh i think i'm back in august i think the next time i can do this show is august 21st um, I don't know if you're around David Carr. Yeah, um, I don't get back till the 26th. So, okay. um, right. but I'm happy to join in again if you guys will have me. Yeah, I'd love to have you when you're available. And uh, Steve is still, I mean, Steve hasn't, uh, you know, Steve's on this trip with me coming up. He's yeah. around. He's just in the middle of some busyness. So, well, he'll be back on too. And maybe it will be that 21st date. We'll definitely have this information out. In the meantime, you can follow me on Instagram, follow stories. I'll be posting as much as I can from Alaska, but it seems like we'll have very little service. David, I'm sure you'll be posting as often as possible, but uh, spoiler alert, you'll have very little service. Yeah, I can't imagine the Wi-Fi and the Serengeti is coming on strong. I don't think they have 5G there net yet. So No, not so much. But you can get a SIM card, a local SIM card. You just have to hand over your passport, let them photograph the info page, the back page, and photograph you against the blank wall. Um, <laughs> I'm not joking. That's what wow. they did for me when I wanted a SIM card. I don't know if it was worth it because uh, I'm sure any day now there's going to be like six home loans taken out in my name. And oh, gosh. That. Uh, I already had that happen once. I don't need that ooh, again. Yeah, that's not good. That's yeah. not good. I actually haven't had anything bad happen. I'm joking, but that they really did do that for them oh, to sell just... me a what did, what did it cost? It cost ten dollars. A ten dollar SIM card that had tons of uh, data. Um and the connection was decent. But once you're out in the Serengeti, no. Nah, nah. Yeah. 
Well, that's good. I need a respite from all that anyway. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, David. Chat room, thank you for hanging out with us. If you are a pen member, thank you so much for your membership. If you're not and you want to be a better photographer, you should seriously consider it. It is a fantastic resource to help you grow as a photographer. And I say this from the bottom of my heart, it is a fantastic community of people. So, you know, some of those things we're talking about where you feel like you're in a rut, we have a great community that can really help you and encourage you and help you get out of that rut if you feel like you're there. All right. That's great. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. It. Safe travels to you. And, and, uh, and to you, sir. We'll see you again in whenever we have the show again. Yeah. A while. Bye-bye, everybody. Adios.